Hello students, welcome to Statics. Today I'm gonna to give you a review for exam two. Exam two is gonna cover chapters five and six of the book, and the duration is 55 minutes. The exam is gonna have a short answer section, which is gonna ask you some fundamental questions about statics, theory, uh, short answer, multiple choice. That section will be worth 40% of the grade and then there'll be two challenge problems that are each worth 30% of the grade. In order to receive credit on this exam, all your work needs to be shown, and partial credit will only be given if work is shown on the page. That includes the short answer questions. The exam is closed booked and closed notes, closed internet, um, and you can't use any person, social media, websites, or services to aid you in completing the exam. Also, um, you shall not share, screenshot, or upload the exam at any time. That includes before, during, or after you've taken your exam and receive it back, right? Um, individuals who have been found to have been cheating during the exam will be reported to the Office of Student Conduct. All right. So the outline, this outline below kind of lists some of the types of problems you could expect on the exam. There could be more than one problem in each of these categories, and there could also be no problem in one of these categories. So it's, it could be anything that's listed in the bullets below. You could be asked for equilibrium in 2D, where you need to draw the free body diagrams and identify knowns and unknowns, and where you need to determine, meaning solve for the reactions at the supports in a structure. You could be asked to identify if a body is properly improperly or redundantly constrained. You can be asked to do equilibrium, equilibrium in 3D, that is draw the free body diagram and identify knowns and unknowns for a 3D problem, as well as determine the magnitude of the reactions by replacing uh, the supports with those reactions, right? So identifying reactions and solving for them. Another two key things that you could be asked is to use the method of joints to determine the forces inside of each members in a truss. You also could be asked separately to use the method of sections to determine the forces in a select few members of a truss. And then finally, you may be asked to identify zero force members, right? So how to study for this exam? The first thing you should do is definitely read chapters five and six. If you haven't read those, read those chapters, there's a lot of details beyond the YouTube videos and beyond the in-class um, stuff that we cover. There's a lot of details that you can gain by just simply reading those chapters, trying to understand what the theory is, is trying to teach you. Um, another thing you should do is answer the reading questions. For every video that's assigned on Carmen, if you click on that video, you'll see that there are reading questions, which are short answer type of questions that you need to read the book in order to solve. Definitely go and try to, to solve those reading questions and use the book. The answers are there, right, in the book. Definitely review the notes as well as the example problems. So the lecture notes from the videos and the example problems we covered in class. Uh, in class, we only have 55 minutes, right? So we usually are able to cover two, maybe three problems. But the example problems usually have more problems that we didn't cover. So definitely go and download those example problems and look at the ones we didn't cover, right? Look at the ones we did cover, but also the ones we didn't. You should also review and redo the homework problems. We've had a number of homeworks already, and you may not remember what we did at the beginning of chapter five, now that we're at the end of chapter six, go back to those homeworks, hold them blindly, right? You've already got your solutions to it, right? And you already have the solutions that have been released. Choose a couple problems and try to solve them and see how you do, right? Just solve them as if they were exam problems. And then once you're done, go and look at your homework and see, did you retain the knowledge on how to solve those problems? Which, which areas or which sections do you need to go back and re-review? And then finally, it's, I, I encourage you to solve extra problems from the book. The book has tons and tons of homework-style problems 
that you can you know just pick at random and try to solve one. It's a great way to practice for the exam. Um, but also there are fundamental problems in the book. And these problems are designed to not trick you, but just to give you like fundamental for this theory that you need to learn in this section. Can you do it? Can, can you apply that theory? Right? So fundamental problems are great for you to practice with. Now on the exam, the way, you know, the things that I'd like to see in your problem solving, especially for those challenge problems, is for you to list your knowns and unknowns. Draw your free body diagram as neatly as possible because both of those you always get credit for. They always, you are always going to get points for knowns and unknowns and free body diagrams. List out any assumptions you're making. If the problem, if you, if, you, if you make an assumption, you assume that something is happening and the supports, tell us what you're assuming. Um, as you're going through the steps of solving your problem, give us the necessary details so we can follow your calculations, so we can actually see your calculations, right? If you leave everything in the calculator, there's no, and the page is blank other than a number, there's no way we can give you partial credit. We can't see your thought process. So don't just input things in your calculator. Put it on the paper, right? And answers without steps will not be accepted. If you've got an answer and there's no shown work, we can't give you any points, right? Do try to label your equations and organize them and then make sure that your answer includes units and that it's in the box for your final answer. And please be neat because disorganized, incomplete works or copied works will be penalized. If we can't follow along what your problem structure is, we can't give you any credit, can't give you partial credit. Now your formula sheet, the same rules apply on the formula sheet for this exam as the last. You are allowed a single letter size formula sheet. So think of a regular piece of computer paper, single sided, only one side. Formula sheet must be physically handwritten on paper. It must not be printed or photocopied. So it can't be something you did on your tablet and then printed out. It can't, cannot be that. And you may not share your formula sheet or copy someone else's formula sheet. It should be something that you created in your study while you were studying and, and getting prepared. The dues for formula sheets, formulas, put your formulas and label them. Um, include diagrams that you may need to understand the formulas, such as parallelograms or triangles. Uh, you can include gravity, unit conversions, and other details you may need. Don't, do not include solutions to any problems, solutions to the reading questions, or sentences or paragraphs, right? Now, anything that's not described above uh, is not allowed on your formula sheet. So if you have any confusion about whether it's something that is allowed, if something is or is not allowed, it is not allowed, right? Formula sheets are collected with your exam and we do check them. So first thing we check when we're grading your exam. And what do you need to bring for the exam? Uh, your mind, pencils, pens, erasers, calculators, rulers, and your single-sided formula sheet, right? So if you follow this outline for the exam, you will be well prepared uh, for exam two, right? Now, uh, as a part of our review, we'll go over kind of three just example problems to help you to get prepared uh, for this exam too. The first thing we'll review is proper, improper, and redundant constraints. Now, redundant constraints. What is a redundant constraint? When a body has redundant supports or constraints, that is more supports than are necessary to hold it in equilibrium, it becomes statically indeterminate. So there's redundant, there's too many constraints. It's redundant, too many. An example is given here below where we have a, a beam. It is fixed supported at A and has a roller at B and at C. If we analyze each of these supports individually, we have three reactions at A, one reaction at B, and one reaction at C. For a total of five unknowns, five reactions for this 2D problem. Now we know that 2D problems, you only have three equations of equilibrium, sum of forces in X, Y, and sum of moments. So just looking at this problem, you can see 
that this body is over constrained. There's more supports than appropriate, than necessary to hold it for equilibrium. So we can't figure out which of these, because there's so many supports, we can't figure out what is the ratio between these supports. And so we call it statically indeterminate. Now there is a way to solve this problem that has five unknowns. And that's when we think about, instead of static bodies uh, and rigid bodies, when we think about uh, um, deformable bodies, that gives us additional equations. If we think of this beam as something that's not rigid, but something that deforms, we can solve this problem because there becomes additional equations. But for statics, this is a statically indeterminate structure. All right? So now let's look at another example. This is a 3D example where we've got a, a pipe assembly that is... Uh, 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 that has a, um, a uh, shaft at A, a, a bearing at A, and a fixed support at B. Now, if we assume um, that there is some level of alignment in the structure, then at A, we'll end up with two reactions, AZ and AY, and at B, we'll end up with the full suite of reactions, uh, Bx, By, Bz, and then moment X, moment Y, and moment Z, right? When we add up these reactions, we see that we have a total of eight unknowns. And this is a 3D problem where we only have six equations, some of forces in X, Y, and Z, and some of moments in X, Y, and Z. Because we have eight unknowns and only six equations, that means we have more support than is required. We have redundant supports in this structure. And so it's statically indeterminate. We can't solve, we can't figure out what is the ratio between these supports because it's, it's over constrained. And again, if we assume this is a deformable body, that'll give us additional equations that could allow us to actually solve this problem. But according to statics, rigid bodies, this is indeterminate, right? So overall, count the number of unknowns. If they're greater than the number of equations, statically indeterminate. Now, another thing that we need to be able to do is identify if something is properly or improperly constrained. Uh, having the same number of unknown uh, reaction forces as available equations of equilibrium, you know, so having a uh, number of unknowns equal to the number of equations does not always guarantee that a body will be stable when subject to loading. There's a couple rules for identifying improper constraints. One is if the line of action of the reaction forces are concurrent or go through a single point. They all go through a single point. For 3D problems, if the line of action of all reaction forces intersect a common axis. And then finally, if the reaction forces are all parallel to each other and that those reactions are perpendicular to the applied loads. Now these rules you know, when you read them, it's like, well, what's that? line of action to reaction, concurrent, this and that. What does it really mean? Well, what we can use is inspection to help us identify if something is improper or properly constrained. If we don't have these rules written down, if we don't understand these rules, it's okay. Because inspection, thinking about physically what's going to happen in a structure, can help us to identify proper or improper. And really, it's all about looking at a structure and saying, will this move? Does this have the ability to move? That's the greatest way to determine if it's improperly constrained. The first example here, we've got a beam. It's pin sort supported at A. It's on a roller at B, and it has an externally applied force of P that's at an angle downwards. Now, if we replace the supports with the reactions, we'll see that all of the reactions 
uh, go through a single point. Their line of actions intersect at a single point. And that is uh, the general rule A. If the line of action, the reactions are concurrent, meaning go through the same point, that means you could have improper constraints. And that's what we have here. Now, inspection can make it even easier for us to see. If we look at that external applied load P, is there anything stopping us from rotating? Think about it. If we look at our supports, they're all forces that have the same line of action. Could this beam rotate? Yes, it can. That means it's improperly constrained. It becomes a dynamics problem where this beam can rotate and move. If we are moving, we are no longer stat static. We are improperly constrained, right? All right, so now let's look at another example. In this example, we have a 3D structure and it is pin supported at A and at B. If we replace those supports with reactions, we have all forces uh, uh, that are, uh, our reactions are all forces. And those forces all intersect along a single axis. That is rule B of the improper, uh, of the general rules. Now, if we don't remember that rule, that's okay, because we can use inspection on this structure to help us figure out what's going on. On this structure, we have a force P, and it's out here on the elbow of this beam. And looking at the structure, we can see we have nothing that's gonna stop this beam from rotating due to that externally applied load. So this beam is not properly supported. It's gonna move, it's gonna be a dynamics problem. And so for this problem, we can say it's dynamic, it's improperly constrained, right? All right, and then our last one here, uh, we've got a L bracket, it's hanging by a bunch of cables uh, that are connected to the roof. If we replace those cables with the reactions we get, we can see that all of the reactions are parallel to each other and they're perpendicular to the externally applied load. All right, so that's the rule three or the, the rule C of the general rules. Now, if we don't remember that rule, that's okay because we can literally look at the structure and say, hey, if I apply 100 newtons of force, is this L bracket gonna swing on these cables back and forward? Yeah, it will, it'll move. That means it's a dynamics problem. And if it's a dynamics problem, that means it is improperly constrained. It's not a statics problem, right? So use these tools uh, and these rules to help you identify redundant, proper, and improperly constrained structures, right? So now let's move on to another example. Uh, this is example 6.3, and it asks us to determine the force in each member of the truss shown and indicate whether the members are in tension or compression. Now, we're going to assume that in this problem, we're asked to do the method of joints. So we're going to go ahead and look at our diagram and see what we are given and write out all of our knowns. And then we are going to look at the diagram, replacing the supports with the reactions which are unknowns. And then we're gonna list out all the forces in the members, which we're being asked to find. So we need to make sure we list all of those unknowns out, right? Especially on the exam, right? Once we've identified our knowns and unknowns, we can create our free body diagram, freeing it from its constraints. And we'll see that we get a CX, CY, and an AY, right? Now, at this point, we have a choice. We, we, have, we should examine our free body diagram and see if we can skip equilibrium in the whole body. We'll be able to skip equilibrium in the whole body if we have a joint where there's at least one unknown and at most, uh, there's at least one known and at most two unknowns. And unfortunately for this structure, wherever we have a known, we have more than two unknowns. So we can't go right into the method of joints. Instead, we've got to solve equilibrium of the entire structure to find the values of these reactions, AY, CX, and CY. So that's what we do here. We uh, go over, we look at our diagram, and we find some of forces in X, Y, and some of the moments, and we get the value 
of these reactions. All right. Once we have those reactions, now we have, we know all of these uh, loading conditions, CX, CY become knowns, and AY becomes a known, right? And now we can start to apply the method of joints. And again, with the method of joints, we've got to have at least one known and at most two unknowns. So a good place for us to start is going to be at, at A, right? Because we know AY and there's only two unknowns there. All right. So then we go in and we apply the method of joints. We analyze joint A. We figure out the uh, length proportional ratios for member AB. And then we, since a joint is a, is a point in space, we have two equations we can solve, some forces in X and Y. So we go ahead and build those equations, and we solve for the force in members AB and AD. And then we move along the chain to another joint. We go to joint D. And that joint, now that we know FAB, now that we found FAB, now we only have two unknowns at that joint, and that means we can solve it. Again, we do sum of forces in X and Y, build out the equation, find FDB and DC, right? And then uh, from there, uh, we'll go and explore another joint. We'll look at joint C. And at joint C, we, we now know FDC, and we know CX and CY. So all we gotta do is uh, the sum of forces um, in the X direction, and we'll end up finding that FCB is 600 Newtons. Now, important thing to remember when doing the method of joints, or, or the important thing to remember when we're trying to find the forces in members, is we always need to indicate if they're in tension or compression. For a joint, it's fairly simple. You can draw a diagram like this on your formula sheet, where if you have a joint and the arrow's coming out of that joint, it's in tension. And if you have a joint and the arrow's going in to that joint, it is compression, right? So looking at your, your diagrams, you can, you can very quickly identify tension and compression. And then finally, when you then snap it all together like Legos, all those joints, if you arrange them with respect to each other, and then you drew the members on the inside, you'll see that in order for equilibrium, equal and opposite, that those internal loads will cancel each other out. So when we get equilibrium of the whole structure, all of these forces aren't exposed, all right? So just remember those diagrams for what's tension, what's compression. Okay, let me return. Okay, that looks good. So now the last example we'll cover in this review. In this review, we're going to do a uh, we're going to look at an example for the method of sections. In this problem, it asks us to determine the force in members BC, CF, and FE, and state if the members are in tension or compression within this truss. We do what we know what to do. We do what we already know to do. We identify our knowns. We look at our supports and identify what reactions should be there. And then we list out those forces in the members that we want to find, right? Once we do that, we then create a free body diagram where we free the body from its constraints, replacing the supports with those reactions. Right? And then... Uh, we can look at this body and we have a choice to make. Now, with the method of sections, we section the body. We cut it along a line that bisects the members that we want to find, the, the, the members whose forces we want to find. When we cut it in half, we can either analyze the left-hand side of a structure or the right-hand side. It could also be top or bottom or top tree, you know, we can cut and slice any way we choose, right? It's the beauty of the method of sections. If there's equilibrium everywhere, there's equilibrium in every slice we take, right? 
Now, if we look at this problem, we've got a gift in this problem. If we were to take the left-hand side, we would have a lot of unknowns. We've got four reactions, and then we have one, two, three forces in those members for a total of seven, of, seven unknowns. That's a lot of work, right? But if we choose the right-hand side, it looks like one, two, three unknowns are all that we have. And if this is a 2D problem where we have three equations, that means we can go directly to the method of sections with this problem. We don't need to find the reactions. We can just get the method of sections right off the top, right? So that's great. And let's do that for this problem. We're going to choose the right-hand side. And we're going to skip equilibrium of the whole body and just do equilibrium in the right-hand side. We'll take our body and slice it in half along that line. And, and when we slice it, we are going to expose the forces in those members. Now, how do we define what the sense of those forces is? There's two ways to go. We can use inspection to identify... A, using the equations of equilibrium to identify the direction an arrow has to go to maintain equilibrium, right? In this case, we start with the sum of the forces in the Y. Well, there's a bunch of Y knowns, right? And there's only one Y unknown. And if those Y knowns are going down, going, you know, directed downwards, then the F, uh, the force CF has to be going upwards to maintain equilibrium, right? It has to. So if we go uh, through that process of inspecting and thinking about equilibrium and balance, we'll be able to figure out these equations, and other, there's other forms of these that we can use to solve this problem. And that gives us the sense of those forces. Now, if we can't use inspection, if we're confused by it, that's okay. We can always assume tension in these members and then when we solve our equation, if our final number is positive, then it's in tension. If our final number is negative, then it was actually in compression. So we put T or C. It's that simple, right? So with this free body diagram created, we go uh, for the method of section. We go ahead and solve our equilibrium equations. We can see by doing inspection, we found equations that are super easy to solve, right? So we just go ahead and rearrange and solve, and we find the values of the force and the members. Now, one thing that can help us with the method of sections is to draw a tension slash compression guide. We can put it on our formula sheet. That helps us understand what happens or how forces are in a, in a joint versus how we might see forces uh, in a member, if we section a member, right? And that can help us when we uh, go to our section and say, hey, you know, which one is in tension and which one is in compression, right? We've got two in tension and two in compression. If we slice the body and the arrows going in like that or the arrows coming out like this, it tells us what we have in the method of sections, right? So feel free to, to include that tension compression guide on your formula sheet. And with that, that is our review for exam two. I hope that you've, you know, have had uh, time to study. You've been able to go through the book, look at the old videos and notes. Uh, some very important to do well on this exam um, because we're very deep in the semester and we're starting to get to the point where there's less and less points for us to accumulate. So, you know, study well. Make sure you space out the time that you study. Don't try to cram all at the last minute if you can help it. And good luck on your exam on Wednesday.